So yeah. this is actually our first episode of um, Dynamic Brain Talk, and we're talking with Dr. Braverman. And we really want to go over a few things, um, starting with um, Dr. Braverman's books. So did you want to start with that, Dr. Braverman? And the Nutra News, where we talk about the edge effect and the revolutionary brain, mind, body science? Absolutely. The brain controls your body and the future of your health. And most of our decisions are made from our brain and mind. As far as I know, none of us are using our pancreas right now to connect to the video or our liver or our heart muscle. The brain is the master organ and the general and the commander in chief of your body. And I know a breakthrough on how to help you master it. So I'm be glad to take your questions on that, Simone. And I'm excited that you know it as well. It's been yes, hard to teach. Absolutely. Well, we've had some questions that were sent in earlier. And one of them goes into your article, like what the Edge Effect talks about, is um, the neurotransmitters and um, how that affects really the brain and what what is that because a lot of people don't even know what that is because we talk okay a neurotransmitter <laughs> a neurotransmitter is a language of the brain and uh, in fact i loved your question last night kind of we practiced and you asked me how did this come about for me and so the first person i worked for was dr carl pfeiffer who's one of the world's brain doctors for the united states served as chairman of Park Davis, Emory, uh, military commands, etc. He was that great in Princeton. And here's what he taught me, that the B vitamin inositol, the B vitamin inositol is a GABA agent, and it's now in the textbooks of psychiatry for anxiety. Whether you get it or not, almost every single person in the world when you start going a little crazy, it starts with anxiety, then blues, then insomnia, then depression, then epilepsy, then uh, seizure, seizures and, and uh, bipolar, and then psychotic and demented. So almost everybody is either a little anxious or anxiety in different forms. So it was a great lesson. Pfeiffer taught me about the trace element lithium. I mean, it's unbelievable, but it's like, you can cure the brain with a little bit of salt, all right? I mean, it's just phenomenal. I mean, all we have to do is give salt, lithium salt, and the brain calms down. And in fact, it's even anti-dementia, small amounts of lithium as orotape. But to stick to the topic, GABA was what I learned from Dr. Pfeiffer. Then he assigned me amino acids, and it turned out that the Boston Harvard Sleep Laboratories did work on serotonin, and that was the sleep agent and melatonin, and they were both sleep agents. And tryptophan was the amino acid that helped you sleep. So then I learned, oh my God, serotonin, and they named it serenity tone. And GABA was for calming, the amino acid for calming in the brain called gamma aminobutyric acid. And then at MIT, a fellow named Wertman, at the same time published that if you eat eggs, you raise your acetylcholine levels, and you can remember more. And so you'll see all these uh, forms of eggs. We have them in, in Whole Foods, country hen with 600 milligrams of choline, uh, 300 milligrams, you know, 2,000 milligrams actually of fish oil. And they all build acetylcholine to enhance memory and cognitive ability. And then I called Dr. Ken Blum, who's the world addiction specialist, a few years before he sh uh, basically turned the world upside down when he published that dopamine controls addictive behavior, alcohol craving, narcotic craving, sugar craving. And it's really dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, or amphetamines in the brain. And then I worked with him on the endorphins or your endogenous morphine or pain receptors. And I had the complete brain. The brain runs like a, a car with four wheels. Another way to look at it is the wheels of brain function. It is your own brain dopamine or amphetamines, your own memory chemicals or systems of storage, just like computers, your own ability to stay level, and your ability to sleep 
And then when any one of those tires breaks, you go grab your spare because you're in pain. And that's when I realized that level of breakthrough. And then the next level of breakthrough was at NYU Medical School. The fellow named Rodolfo Linus was keeping brains alive in a dish. And he says there's an interface between the brain's generator and the thalamus and the brain's alpha waves and the brain's uh, electricity. The long and short of it is that at that point, I realized that the combination of neurotransmitter gave an edge effect result. A lot of people call that the Zen of being in an activity. You know, they talk about getting in your zone. They talk about uh, getting a certain meditative peace. Uh, individuals throughout history, I, they call Einstein, who said that the, uh, everything is light as a wave in a particle got into a glorious zone in 1905 where he wrote what are considered the four greatest papers in physics. To get into that zone, I learned the brain was electrical and it was a wave and a particle. So I learned the electricity of the brain and the chemistry of the brain. And I could pretty much help anyone get into the zone if they want to. So sorry for the long introduction to the edge effect, but it was a good review of, of people of how I, I, I built up the four neurotransmitters, switched to the electricity, which also began with Dr. Pfeiffer as what was called alpha waves of meditation back then. We measured them and then continued to advance with Harvard's groups, Frank Duffy, Eroy Johns at NYU. And now I feel I'm an expert on the brain and, I, and I'm still willing to take a class. You know, I took <laughs> a class with Dr. Amen the other day. Well, that's cool. So talking about this, there, there was a question. Are there any new tests um, that can show neurotransmitter dominance? Let's say blood, saliva, or just your Braverman test? And if it's just your Braverman test, what really inspired you to create that? What was the, again, how, how did that come to be? Okay. All right. Firstly, the, the Braverman test is written so that the bulk of 300 million Americans and let's say 2 billion literate people out of the world to 3 billion, that they could, who wouldn't have access to complex medicine, that they could do some type of simple assessment for their well-being. So just like almost everywhere in the world, Doctors have access to showing people how to take their pulse and they, you can pick up atrial fibrillation and arrhythmias just through the pulse, right? And that was done for millennium, thousands of years. So I wanted to give people a brain pulse quiz. And that's what the Braverman test is. So that's your easy brain pulse. Now, when it comes to how brain medicine should be done, you can put the brain on one side and all the computers of the world on the other and your brain is more complicated. So the, the dream of how to assess the brain is many, many questions done by computers that ask you concussions, seizures, meningitis, vaccine history, head traumas, whiplashes, car accidents, ski accidents, mood changes, sleep disorder, family history, genetic history, relative history, manic depression history in your family, drug history, pot, alcohol, any medication, blood clotting. Every single organ system contributes to brain function. The thyroid nodules that most people develop affect the brain. If you're osteoporotic, which most people are getting shorter with age, that affects the brain. Everything, cerebral blood flow, uh, the second heart is what I call leg muscles, the loss of, of the ovary, ovaries, estrogen from 30 on, the loss of men's testosterone from 40 on, the change in many hormones that the brain regulates from the hypothalamus and pituitary, FSH, LH. So the massive amount of information to know the, the brain is actually fairly easy in America where we have the financial resources, the blood testing, and the skills to measure cerebral blood flow, 
uh, all the organ systems with ultrasound. And then we can go another level. We can do the EKG of the brain, which is a beam test brain electrical activity map. You can do an MRI with, court, with new neuroquantitative programs to measure atrophy. You can test specific forms of memory and rate a person's function by me measuring memory of the auditory, uh, verbal, and, long and working memories and long-term memories, and there are multiple memory functions. And you can measure attention and you can measure cognitive domains. And we can give people the, the list of what are called the thinking domains. So, that, so I have a vision of how we get smarter, but we need to continue. Then after the MRI, we now have PET imaging, and we have imaging in such a way that we can measure why I was right about the concussions in football, that 99% of the football players have beginning of concussion, traumatic encephalopathy. We have flora beta power. We have uh, amyloid tracers. We have glucose tracers on PET scanning. We have the ability to measure the brain's uh, a magnetic field. All right, just like the earth has a magnetic field, this is Maxwell's great equations that if wherever there's an electrical field, there's a magnetic field and the brain has a magnetic field. So now to boil it down so I don't so I'm just going to stop you there just for one second because now the 5G is coming out. How is that going to affect the brain's electromagnetic field? Okay, that, that's a separate question. We're going to make sure okay. your audience understands simple because I just got a lecture okay. from generals on how to communicate so people understand you. Okay. You have questionnaires in which I provided a biochemical behavioral questionnaire. Then you have pure behavioral questionnaires, and there are 50 of them, 100 of them that are validated and reliable. That's what a psychological test is. Hamilton anxiety rating scales, Milan scales, Myers-Briggs scales, Firo B scales. Those are scales that are not bridging the interface between brain, mind, and chemistry. They are scales of behavior. Then you have electrical analysis of the brain. Then you have an MRI, which is an anatomical analysis. Then you have the PET scan, which is metabolic analysis. And then you have magnetic analysis. So it's five things. It's pen and paper, all right, which is just uh, question, questionnaires, electricity in the brain, anatomy of the brain, metabolism in the brain, magnets in the brain. And that allows the possibility of the human dream of keeping the brain alive 800 years. The brain's got a lot more tread in it than the body does. Body is hard to keep alive a long time. All right, so that's very exciting to me. Now, your, your question, which is, what does EMF do to the brain? Yes. Is probably contrary to what people think, all right? Like, and it's, and radiation would be a whole big discussion. We should lay out the electromagnetic field, but let's just take visible light. A day in the sun is worth 50,000 units of vitamin D. And as a rule, some kind of vitamin D is central, 10 minutes at least outside, is central to health because the vitamin D converts to the kidney, from the skin to the kidneys to the brain function in terms of, of many, many functions. In fact, ultimately, vitamin D are, is a steroid. If you're in the sun all the time, you're going to die of skin cancer. If you live in the Caribbean, you're going to die of infectious diseases or you're going to have hurricanes like the great alexander hamilton you know to the point where there's no drinking water sickness and they they all pay to ship hamilton up from the caribbean to where he can make it big in new york the caribbean too warm all the time too much sunshine is dangerous all right for health the reality is most of the electronic machines we have today and most of the technology we have today is allowing the human brain that we have to function at 25 times the wattage or power than it did 100 years ago. 
So we can be smarter than ever before that somehow the electronic processes is connect, are connecting us and making us in, more intellectually superior and reach more of our intellectual potential. Are there downsides? I'm not that worried about 5G. I'm worried about, uh, you know, Kim Dong or whatever his name is in North <laughs> Korea with his uh, nuclear weapons. I worry about nuclear terrorism as Secretary of Perry at the Kennedy School Defense Secretary warned the biggest risk for all of us is, is nuclear terrorism. Okay, but does 5G affect the brain? My first reaction to is that I'm sure it does, but I'm thinking that in the long run, it's likely to be more positive than negative. And, I will, and it depends on distance. What I was trying to tell you is that radiation is dose related and has to do with where you are and what other metabolic factors are involved. I don't think it, I, I have to, I could spend more time on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could pull up, you know, the, what we would do is give everyone electromagnetic spectrum, but our lecture that we talked about today was we we're going to focus in on the, uh, the areas of the brain that in each chemistry area. I, do, I am not worried about 5G. I have it in my okay. home. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. So, okay, so then we're going to talk about the brain. So right now, everybody is kind of self-isolating, and it looks like people are coming out of that. But um, the long-term effect on the brain from the self-isolation and the people that even going out, the anxiety that's out there, how, how is that affecting the brain health of a person? Like well, long -term? Right Introver now. First of all, many people thrive in uh, isolation. I mean, uh, you know, the quarantining of, but we have to accept 25% of the society at best, 20% are introverts, and they're going to do just fine in isolation. Those that are dependent on uh, the interactions and the busyness and the, and the television and the, and the sports shows and the outdoor activities those individuals are doing an exercise whether they get it or not that is known to be healthy for them even if uncomfortable which is reflection and there's a group of exercises known in myers-briggs on introspection reflection self-analysis behavioral and moral reflection all of those are of value they may not be comfortable all right just like it may not be comfortable for an introvert to do a give and take conversation. All right. They, they sometimes introverts tend to just want to talk and talk at a person rather than with a person. But the reality is that uncomfortable and being losing, leaving your comfort zone is how we grow. General Mattis summarizes growth is in his famous phrase, post-traumatic growth disorder which is an antidote to the crutches of the entitlement industry of post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm doing this Zoom interaction with you because we want everyone to get the tools to sleep. If they're not sleeping well, they, you know, we, we wanna go over the goals. The goals for the brain is to get as much light as possible. So it's to get up at sunrise if you can. All right, I don't do it, but if you can. Then the goal is to eat early. And there's a reason why eggs are top breakfast and coffee because they're dopamine, acetylcholine foods, all right, with low calorie and low fat so you don't get drowsy again. They also stop craving. You don't have sugar. You don't feed your sugar craving, if you don't, especially if you use stevia or some other natural sweetener. Then the goal is to have your first vegetable, fruit, and probiotics in the morning, whether it's a couple green beans or, you know, some cucumbers or it's uh, raspberries with flaxseed, with metamucil, with a probiotic, with a little bit of cereal, with a little honey or a little maple syrup just to give it some tolerability or and some lecithin. The key is to add lecithin or choline type powders to that breakfast. And then the goal is to get the, figure out how in a day because every day is a health day and every day is a war with oneself, most importantly. 
and you want to think well, how are you going to get an hour of exercise in a day? How are you going to get at least three or four hours of aerobic exercise in a week? How are you going to get enough energy to meet your day needs and get extra output so that you can give more love to your family, friends, whatever you want to do with that love? Because love is the name of the game. And to be healthy, brain-wise, means a more loving brain. A more healthy brain is a more loving brain. You can do more for others. And you got to get figure out how you're going to get five vegetables in, five fruit servings, even three. I mean, you know, and how are you going to get tea later in the day? Some of those green tea or white tea, which might be even healthier. And all the and, – and still not be too overcharged so you can't fall asleep at night. At before, ideally, before midnight, everyone should be in, asleep. All right, so that's my summary. Okay, so with that, with the – right now, because I did get some messages of people saying that they're having so much anxiety, they're having a really hard time even getting to sleep. And then they, they need gabapentin and inositol, and they need to get the exercise up and their motivation up. And then we have a, an analysis of motivation is a very complicated thing to do. So motivation – you hate to say, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And I'll give you the story of General Patton. He slaps a soldier in Italy and says, get out there. And he has to apologize later because some people are broken. So I don't want to slap anyone across the face and say, you need to take this tea or caffeine to get your energy up. I don't know. They could have lost a parent, a child, a divorce, 